Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to day two of our three-day series, 40 Years of the U.S. Department of Education, Examining Its Past, Present, and Future. Uh, today's installment is looking at what the Department of Education has accomplished. Uh, thanks, everybody, who joined us yesterday for looking at you know, the beginning of the U.S. Department of Education and why we have it. I also realized that at the beginning of yesterday's program, I forgot to tell people who I am. Uh, my name is Neil, uh, Neil McCluskey, and I am the director of the Center for Educational Freedom at the Cato Institute. Many of you probably already knew that, but for those of you who didn't, now you have that crucial information. Um, today, as I said, we're going to be discussing what the Department of Education has accomplished. Um, and it's my great pleasure to introduce uh, our two additional panelists. Today, I'll be wearing two hats. I will be both moderating and a panelist. Um, but the two other panelists, sort of the full panelists, um, are Vicki Alger. She is a research fellow at the Independent Institute and author of the book Failure, the Federal Miseducation of America's Children. And then Cindy Brown, who is a senior fellow at the Center for American Progress and was the first assistant secretary for civil rights in the U.S. Department of Education. Um, just a reminder, especially if you weren't watching yesterday, um, there is a slight delay uh, when people speak on this platform. And so I will be specifically asking people questions. So it may seem a little bit unnatural uh, that people aren't just having a bantering back and forth, but this way we're not all uh, talking on top of each other and sort of leading to verbal gridlock. Um, also, if you have questions or comments, uh, you can send them any number of ways, depending on how you're watching. If you're on Twitter, you can send questions that way using hashtag CatoCEF. You can send questions on Facebook, on YouTube, however you happen to be watching this. Oh, and also, of course, on Cato's website, cato.org. Um, and the... Uh, uh, I think, I guess that's all the housekeeping I have for this. I'm sure there's something I forgot. Oh, just yes, a reminder that this is all kind of a brave new world for everybody as we do things from our home and we have to be kind, you know, become sort of technical experts, although Cato has great technical experts who really make all this work. Um, but if we have technical difficulties, please just bear with us. And with that, I will call on our first panelist, who is me. Thank you. I will go ahead now. Um, so uh, our question is, what has the Department of Education accomplished? And so what I want to do first is sort of make clear that there is clearly a, a lot of connections between the Department of Education and federal education policy. Um, but many of those policies could and have existed in the absence of the Department of Education. So I am going to focus in particular on the department itself. That said, just to sort of set the stage here, um, I don't think that the uh, evidence on what the federal involvement in education has accomplished, I don't think it's particularly encouraging, keeping in mind that this is very broad information, very broad data, and there are lots of things the department does, lots of ways to measure success. But just to give you some sort of benchmark of what we're talking about, in 1980, and that, of course, is the year that the U.S. Department of Education started, May 4th, so this coming Monday is the 40th birthday, uh, in 1980, using inflation-adjusted dollars, the federal government spent about $115 billion on education ac across all uh, levels, so pre-K, K-12, through higher education. That includes student loans and lots of different things that the federal government spends money on. So it was $115 billion in inflation-adjusted money. Um, in 2018, it spent $296 billion. So it it more than doubled what was being spent. Again, now we're talking about some very basic benchmarks. Um, if we look at, first of all, uh, uh, achievement in K through 12 education, um, what we see is the 12th grade scores on the National Assessment of Educational Progress, that's sort of a federal exam that's given to a representative sample of students. Most kids will never take it, but you can get uh, an accurate read on what kids know, at least as judged by that test, uh, uh, using that sort of sampling. 
And what we've seen is 12th grade scores, so kind of the final products of our system, and I should say 17-year-olds, depending on which NAEP you're using, but the long-term trend is 17-year-olds. We've seen those be basically flat, especially in reading. So there's at least a good question, what has ultimately been accomplished in K-12 education for that spending? The other part of it is higher education. This is the major thing that the federal government is involved in. Again, also there's pre-K, but, and we can look at federal programs are in particular supposed to give people, uh, lower income people access to higher education, at least so that money is not, not a burden. But what we see is um, in 1970, the lowest uh, income quartile, so the poorest quarter of families only 6% of people under the age or 24 or um, younger had completed a bachelor's degree in that group. Um, by 2017, that had only risen to 13%. So very little growth. Um, meanwhile, from people from the highest income quartile, the richest, you went from 1970, about 40% of people from that group uh, under 24 had a bachelor's degree. Today, it's 62%. So as a relative matter in particular, if anything, low-income people have been falling behind. That gives you at least some reason to believe that the federal presence in education has not been helpful, although there's a lot going on there. If you look at younger than 17-year-olds, you see better movement in scores. Um, and so don't take this as the absolute word, but the broad evidence suggests it hasn't been helping. So, but like what I said, I want to talk about the Department of Education in particular as sort of what is concerning about it separate from overall federal policy, because just because you move something out of the department doesn't mean the federal government stops doing that. Um, and I think that what the main problem is, is this department gives a one single locus, one area for federal education policy. And for one thing, psychologically, that leads a lot of people to think, well, they, these people are in charge of education. And in fact, Senator uh, Patty Murray, uh, when uh, Betsy DeVos was being um, vetted for uh, the secretary's job, um, she said that secretary, if she were confirmed at the time, she hadn't been, um, if she were confirmed, she would oversee the education of all our kids. Now, that's not the role of the U.S. Department of Education. It's not supposed to oversee all schools and how all schools run. But that is what it seems like if you have one national secretary of education. It's particularly problematic to have centralized control in a very large, very diverse country like ours. Um, and over the 40 years of the Departments of Education's existence, we have seen how this mindset of the federal government is in charge and ultimately the federal government taking charge has evolved. So at the beginning of the Department of Education, it, the federal government had been heavily involved in education really since the mid 1960s. Most of that was about spending money. Once the department is created and it doesn't get abolished quickly by President Reagan, it starts to take on sort of a bully pulpit leadership role uh, with a nation at risk that said that if uh, our school, if a foreign country had done to us what our school, what we've done to ourselves with our schools, we'd consider it an act of war. Um, that started people looking to Washington for guidance on education. You eventually had Secretary of Education Bill Bennett, who was a, you know, a very a big personality, had a lot to say about education. People started to look to Washington for guidance. And then in the late 80s, you started to have federal law changed that required outcomes measures to the point where you get to No Child Left Behind in 2002, and the federal government says, what the structure for K through 12 education will be for public schools basically everywhere. That you have to have uh, state tests uh, that align to state standards and that everybody has to reach something called proficiency by 2014. There's a lot of play in there, but that was sort of an unprecedented amount of control for the federal government because people started to say, well, we have this one locus uh, of control. These seem to be the people in charge. And we reached the point where the federal government was almost dictating everything with the common core. The Common Core came about in particular because of Race to the Top, which was part of the stimulus for the Great Recession. Um, and we only pulled back from that. Uh, and by the way, there were also tests selected by the federal government to go with the Common Core. We only pulled away from that in 2015 because there's, there was essentially an almost across the board or at least uh, pan-ideological agreement that there's too much focus on standards and testing. 
But even today, we have again sort of dipped our toe, or the Department of Education is dipping its toe into sort of unilaterally making decisions for people. Uh, and you can see at the bottom of the page on our website for this event, there's a blog post about there's now sort of a very small race to the top uh, that goes with COVID-19 release. So I think the main problem is we have set up a Department of Education that seems like it should be in control and increasingly it has, which is incompatible with a very diverse, very widespread, very big country. Uh, and with that, uh, I will stop and send it over to Vicki. Well, Neil, I'd like to say thank you and thank you to the Cato Institute for hosting this wonderful event. It's too bad Washington DC is shut down and we can't have a big ticker tape parade for the 40th uh, birthday of the, of the US Department of Education. But I will say that at 40, this is actually a midlife crisis more than 100 years in the making. Because as we know, the US Department of Education was actually established for the first time in 1867. Now, after just one year, it was downgraded, shuffled around, rebranded uh, from one coat closet in the federal government to another until it resurfaced again as we know it in 1979. And then in 1980, it became operational. Now, the justification for making a cabinet level Department of Education essentially boils down to three things. We were told that a US Department of Education would number one, improve student achievement. Number two, would improve the efficiency of all the dollars we spend on education. And number three, it would improve the partnership the federal government has with the states in providing education to children. Well, just a cursory review of how those promises have worked out is sorely disappointing. As Neil, you pointed out in great detail, spending has more than doubled in real terms, yet achievement across grade level subjects has essentially been flat. In fact, uh, the latest insight from the U.S. Department of Education was common core, uh, quote unquote, state standards. And what we're seeing from the nation's report card or the national assessment of educational progress, the test that's put out regularly by the U.S. Department of Education, is that overall, we've seen a decline in student achievement. So that in and of itself is just the latest condemnation in terms of the US Department of Education's expertise. Well, what about improved efficiency? We're now spending on average $14,000 per student. If you're in places like California, it's closer to $20,000. DC, it's approaching $30,000. The problem is large majorities of students, whether you're disadvantaged, no matter your socioeconomic background, are not proficient in basic subjects. Now, the third promise, let's improve the partnership with the states. One of the biggest concerns in approving a US Department of Education was in the recent iteration in the 70s, was that the federal government would basically be America's school board. And we were assured, no, 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 that wouldn't happen. But I think after 40 years, the relationship could boil down to this. We're being bribed with our own money. And in order to bring back as much of our bacon to our states as we can to spend on our students in schools, we have to go along with a lot of red tape. One way to think about the money that we're sending and getting back is this. Essentially, for every dollar we send to DC for education, we get about a dime back. And that dime is wrapped with a whole lot of red tape. So I think in the final analysis, We've had 40 years of the Department of Education. It certainly isn't like a fine wine. It hasn't improved with age. And I think we have to move back to what actually is constitutional and is working. And that is putting parents in charge of their children's education and moving it to the states, making it more local and allowing parents to choose whatever educational option they believe is best for their children. Great, thanks, Cindy, all yours.
Okay, well, my story's a little different. Um, I, uh, I've actually spent my whole career working on issues of civil rights and education uh, for low-income and minority kids. So the Office for Civil Rights, um, you know, existed in the Department of Health, Education, and Welfare. I, I was deputy director of it. And when the Department of Education was created, two-thirds of the office moved over to the Department of Education. It was charged with enforcing laws that eliminate discrimination based on race, color, national origin, gender, disability, and language minority status. Did I leave one out? I'm not sure. <laughs> anyway, um, so actually in, in, in the um, Carter administration, where the Office for Civil Rights was only there about eight months, it, we actually accomplished quite a bit. Um, probably the, the most well-known uh, effort was the effort to uh, eliminate discrimination against women and girls in intercollegiate athletics. And, and that had a, that was a, a big struggle. I was put in charge of it. Uh, and the results have been phenomenal. If uh, everyone who has a daughter uh, has probably today probably reaps the benefits of young girls being able to participate and, and, and college women be able to participate in competitive sports. But there were other things that 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 was Office for Civil Rights, as it's called OCI, was involved with, including uh, desegregation of public universities in southern and border states. That was another big high uh, struggle. Uh, probably the biggest struggle was with the University of North Carolina system. Um, there were Regulations were put out to enforce the Individuals with Disability Education Act uh, um, and accompanying civil rights laws to that. Uh, there, there was a big case on desegregation of public schools in Chicago that was very uh, uh, contentious. Um, and there was um, new policy on bilingual education and um, policies for vocational education. Vocational education was segregated in a lot of public schools. And then <clears throat> at the beginning of the Office for Civil Rights in the Carter administration, there were four lawsuits against the Office for Civil Rights for failure to pro process complaints. There was a big complaint backlog. And so, we were able to negotiate settlements in all those cases. And um, uh, that was important and to gain the trust of the people who were affected by, by the laws. Um, so we actually did accomplish a lot. Then uh, some of it has been undone uh, to say the least. The laws on segregation have changed tremendously. Um, intercollegiate athletics survives and um, has done, there have been numerous, there have been challenges to it in Congress, but what people always forget is that men have daughters and they care about uh, their daughters having equal opportunities. Um, so, I'll stop there. I could talk endlessly about the Office for Civil Rights. I've also been very involved with um, education policy as it affects low-income and minority kids. And I don't, I don't have much disagreement with what the other speakers have said, although I don't believe I'm not a big parent, uh, giving parents responsibility for their... I, I believe in choice. You probably would all be interested to know that I'm... Uh, chair of a charter school board. So I do believe in public school choice. <laughs>
Um, so I'll stop there. Well, thanks. Um, I'm glad that both panelists uh, have been well disciplined and keeping within seven minutes. I'm the only one who did that wrong. So, uh, but I'm the moderator, so I get kind of a law unto myself, so I can do whatever I want. Um, but that said, before we get to audience questions, and we have a bunch of them, um, I'm going to combine a whole bunch into one question. But uh, Cindy was talking about civil rights, so I thought this would be a good time to bring this up. Uh, do, do you all agree that civil rights enforcement is a legitimate federal role in education? And if so, is that something that should be with the Department of Education? Uh, I wrote in a paper, which you can find at the bottom of the Cato site for this, uh, that co-authored with a bunch of folks from Heritage Foundation and Freedom Works and the Pioneer Institute. But um, we write in there that the federal government probably does have a role in civil rights enforcement. Uh, I think that much of it should be with the courts. Um, but what's being done with the Office of Civil Rights probably belongs in the Department of Justice instead of the Department of Education. But so do you all think that there is a federal role in civil rights enforcement? Should it be with the department? Um, and and I'll, I'll leave it at there. Then I have one other question that maybe we'll get to about another thing you may think is something the federal government should do. But first, we'll talk about civil rights. And let me start with Cindy, and we'll go in sort of reverse order. Well, of course, I think there's an important federal role in civil rights. We have long established laws. Um, you know, it wouldn't be the end of the world to transfer the Office for Civil Rights to the Justice Department. Um, as long as you uh, use the administrative procedures and that you don't go through court cases to resolve every issue. That, I think, would be a big mistake. Um, th there is another, the unit, I'm trying to remember the name of the office in the Justice Department that deals with some, it's the Community Relations Service, that's right. That's another office that works on issues of discrimination within the Justice Department, but doesn't just rely on lawsuits. It's important to use the administrative process, I believe, not just lawsuits. Lawsuits take way too long. Vicki? Well, I would agree that there's a, there is a federal role, and I would say in the sense that we have a federal system. So the states and the federal, federal government act as, an, as a check on each other. I would also agree that moving the Office for Civil Rights into Department of Justice makes a lot more sense. But one thing that we do have to be very careful about is using that, or just like any other federal office, but particularly when we're talking about rights, using that office as a vehicle for certain political agendas. Most recently, uh, this, this sort of restorative justice and furthering policies to keep children safe and at school and affecting disciplinary policies where schools now interpret those rules and guidance, that sort of administrative function as uh, we better not discipline, you know, children who happen to be from this group or that group. It's one thing to investigate potential instances of discrimination. It's quite another to fiat that if your rates of discipline pass a certain threshold, you de facto are discriminatory and you have to prove yourself innocent. So I, I would say we have to be very cautious about letting any of our governmental divisions become a vehicle for political agendas. Terrific. Okay, now I'm going to get to audience questions. Um, I will not be able to mention everybody by name who submitted a question, in part because a lot of people did it anonymously, um, but we have several about the Common Core, so I'm going to combine them all into one uh, sort of meta question. I will say that one of them comes from Rick. He says, where or how was Common Core conceptualized? 
Uh, another one says, who created the Common Core since it was not the Department of Education? Uh, and uh, Vicki, maybe you'd like to uh, explain sort of how the Common Core came about and what role the Department of Education had in that. Well, I think this is an excellent question and it's one that comes up very frequently. The sad part is, is that we have to ask it. The fact that it was it's so secretive and its origins seem a little murky to most people, I think is indicative of the problem. Essentially what happened is starting around, oh, in 2008, 2009, uh, a group of quote unquote stakeholders uh, got together. These are folks in um, various business communities, um, affiliated education groups, uh, with the support of the Obama administration, by the way. They may not have been the direct cause, but they were certainly involved. And let's face it, Common Core on its face seems very appealing. Higher standards, standards that are a little bit more uniform so you actually know how your child uh, is performing relative to children in other parts of the country and the goal was other parts of the world. The problem is when you look at who these stakeholders were, the only two actual academics, folks who actually teach you know, math and reading, refused to sign off on it. So the main criticism is, is this became a highly politicized process that actually you know, forced standards that were in many cases lower or worse than other state standards. And a lot of people got you know, testing companies, the textbook companies, this was a way to get a lot of our harder tax dollars through the federal government under the auspices of Common Core. So many people, myself included, believe that it's largely a political process for whatever good intentions it may have started out with. It certainly hasn't lived up to any of its promises either. In fact, there's, you know, studies out right now, research out right now that shows that students' results on the nation's report card that it's, is administered by the U.S. Department of Education is we see declines and in some cases historic lows. So for all the good intentions, government doesn't know best and parents were right to have concerns because there's not just a problem with the academics, there's also a problem with politicization and other things like that, over testing. So that hasn't gotten the job done either, yet we have spent billions of dollars. Schools nationwide have had to endure chaos, cost, and upheaval, getting rid of the old testing regime and putting in the new one. Now this one doesn't work and we'll be on to the next thing. Yeah, um, so uh, Ted Rebarber at the Pioneer Institute, they just published a paper uh, examining the test scores for states based on uh, how much or how um, adamantly they adopted the um, Common Core. Uh, Ted is also one of the co-authors on the paper that you can find at the bottom of our page. Uh, and I think it's important that the Common Core really typifies what I was talking about, um, where I think the Department of Education has become what people look to when they want to get stuff put on the country and they don't want to do, I think, sometimes the hard work of convincing state by state or better yet, uh, district by district or family by family that what they want is good. And it became very much uh, uh, intertwined with lots of rules and regulations and the Department of Education even saying, look, we're going to give you relief from rules and regulations sort of unilaterally if you do what we want you to do, including adopt the Common Core, adopt the tests. And so this was really the apogee of what I worry about, which is you have a department that kind of does think it gets to make unilateral decisions for the whole country and people look to it as a place to do that. Um, Cindy, did you have something you wanted to Anything you want to add about the Common Core? Well, I'm, I'm a, a supporter of it, but uh, clearly the politics of it got very messed up. And um, I, I've thought a lot about it. I. I think that we need fundamental changes in, in how we do education in this country. It's really off the topic, I suppose, but I would 
have state systems of education and I'd fund all schools through the state, though I wouldn't run them at the state level. I wouldn't operate them from the state. But that way you'd get some equity in financing and uh, you could put greater amounts of money where the need was greatest. Um, anyway, probably the purpose of this session is not to discuss all my recommendations on that. But, uh, you know, I've been very disappointed with results. Um, you know, I don't quarrel with the results you guys were citing earlier. Uh, and, you know, it's, it makes me very sad that we haven't made more progress on student achievement. And I think it's because we've approached education in this country in fundamentally wrong ways. Great. Um, and actually, I think that's a terrific answer. I mean, when we're talking about the Department of Education, it's important to think about, well, what are other ways to do this? So I think there's no problem if you talk about uh, other potential models for delivering education. Uh, now, related to what we were just talking about, though, which I think is a good point, and unfortunately, uh, I have a lot of questions and now have lost uh, the name of the person who asked this one. So uh, I apologize to whoever you are. I'm sure I'll find it eventually. But uh, it was really an excellent question because we were, and and it's connected to other people's questions. We, uh, I, for instance, talked about national assessment of educational progress scores. Uh, Vicky talked about them. Uh, we're certainly talking about the Department of Education. And somebody rightly asked, well, you know, you have school districts all over the country. You have states are involved. You have lots of people involved. Is it really fair? to blame the Department of Education for these bad outcomes. And I, at least for me, I wanna be clear, I don't blame the Department of Education necessarily for the bad outcomes. They have different, uh, it has different influence and different things. I think it probably hasn't. Uh, it may have contributed to some of the bad outcomes, but absolutely, it is not the case that only the Department of Education uh, can be held responsible for the outcomes we have, good or bad, and we always have a political problem of we like to assign blame to one thing because that's easy. But I, I mentioned the data more to say we don't have strong evidence that the Department of Education has been very helpful. Um, but uh, maybe I can't remember who I went with first. Uh, we'll go with Cindy then first, because I think I went with Vicky last time. I'm sorry, <laughs> I'm not doing this totally fair, but- uh, Oh, that's okay. <laughs> what do you think? <laughs> What do you think of well, this question you know, of I think how much right. blame does Ed get? Well, they sh it shouldn't be blamed for for education outcomes in this country. I think what you have to blame, as I was, was saying a moment ago, is the structure of our education system. You know, educating kids based on property tax, which is the main source of uh, funding for for um, schooling, and then allowing you know, states like New Jersey that have a whole bunch of little districts that are segregated, which are the boundaries are drawn uh, around uh, populations of, of white and African American um, and, and places where, you know, they can, they can rely on the property tax for a lot of money. You know, it's ridiculous. And um, that's why I believe we need Start deep structural change, and that including um, the, the state-funded uh, systems of education. Thanks, Vicki. Well, I I would agree that we can't just scapegoat the U.S. Department of Education, but it sure is easy to pick on them when we hear we heard all of these highfalutin promises, particularly if you go back and read the history that you know, I include in my book failure, just some of the gems about the over the top hyperbole about we're going to be the united expert head and we're gonna have all this wisdom flowing out into the states correcting all this, you know, these bad ways of teaching it's it's really just eye rolling to put it mildly. So the US Department of Education has kind of set itself up to take the blame, uh, particularly when it acts as though 
it's the expert. Our uh, state, you know, superintendents have to fly to DC. And for those of us, I'm, I'm in Arizona, fly thousands of miles to meet with various and sundry bureaucrats, get permission, do the, the schmoozing and the woozing to get as much of our own money back. Um, it's, it, it's not, they make themselves a target. But I will say one of the things that we have to get out of is we're so busy looking at the US Department of Education and DC when we really should be looking in the opposite direction. What's going on with our school boards? And I wonder how many people could name even one school board member, or do you have any idea of how much your local superintendent or the eighth assistant superintendent for administrative streamlining is making? So rather than default to there ought to be a government, that is to say federal program, we need to be looking at what's going on in the states. Because one thing that I find very frustrating and recent weeks uh, is, is no exception, the US Department of Education is always a Johnny come lately. It was you know decades after we had public charter schools that US Department of Education now supports charter schools. And we've had various parental choice programs coming from the states all different forms, publicly funded vouchers, uh, privately financed tax credit scholarships, now education savings accounts, which are akin to health savings accounts, except for education. This didn't come from DC. This came from those of us in the states. So I think at a minimum, would the states do a heck of a lot better than the US Department of Education if they tried to run education? No, but we certainly don't need a bureaucracy, it would be a huge step forward, I think, to move education back to where it should be, um, states and you know local communities, and doesn't get much more local than parents. Great. Uh, yeah, we have a lot of questions coming in, so we're going to try and get to these as fast as possible. I would just add one thing, though, that uh, the standards and accountability movement, this idea that you have state standards and you test kids on how well they are doing. Um, it's interesting that No Child Left Behind sort of uh, took that all national. Um, and I think that that was part of the reason there was such a massive backlash against it. And there is some evidence that standards and accountability uh, systems work. Uh, but because it was taken national, it was made so blunt there were a lot of states that have been doing it before the federal government, and it ended up being nationally sort of uh, pilloried after a while. And I wonder if many states might have stuck with it longer uh, if the federal government hadn't been involved. Um, but now, um, this is a question that I think is really important, and it goes to kind of how government works even more broadly than the Department of Education. But Fritz asks, is the department the originator of the rules, all the red tape? Or is the legislation created by Congress, which the department must follow when it writes regulations and guidance? Basically, is the bureaucracy taking power it isn't given, or has the legislature ceded power to the bureaucracy? Uh, we'll ask Vicki first. I think that's a terrific question, like which came first, the chicken or the egg? Um, it's very interesting to look at the debates about whether or not we should have a Department of Education back in the 1800s uh, and prior, because up until the Civil War, uh, so many of our presidents, uh, Washington, Jefferson, Madison, most of all, really pushed to have some kind of federal role in education. But up until the, you know, the Civil War, unless there was you know, an amendment to the Constitution, the federal government had no authority to do it. Well, flash forward to today and Congress gives the U.S. Department of Education, the U.S. Department of Education must do some things. There's certain mandatory programs, but at least half of its budget is are, are discretionary programs. The Department of Education makes much of the policy and the guidance. So it's not an innocent, it's not a victim. And what happens is we in the states get held to a lot of these policies that in some cases don't make sense or sometimes com contradictory. And let's face it, we have over 300 education programs at the federal level uh, administered by various education uh, federal agencies. 
ask, go to DC and ask for the definition of an education program. It doesn't exist. So there's a broad latitude. It's a great question. Uh, Congress could do a lot to, I would say, eliminate the US Department of Education, but the US Department of Education itself for its policy making and guidance certainly, again, is no victim. Cindy? Well, now I've forgotten the question, but I think it was oh, the, about education. The question was, does, does the department sort of on its own write lots of rules and regulations, or is the problem really with the legislature because it passes laws that either require a lot of rules or regulations, or maybe because they don't, they just leave a lot of blanks and they actually well, don't want to make you know, decisions and they leave it to the department. Yeah, well, you have to look, you have to go back and look at the origins of the of, of the legislation. And, um, you know, there are various interest groups that are putting pressure on Congress to pass programs and, and, and award funds uh, to fund them. Um, interest group politics around the Department of Education are very uh, substantial. And of course, the biggest interest group of all, the teacher unions, had a huge role to play in the creation of the Department of Education. So the creation of the Department of Education was not bipartisan. However, um, later legislation like No Child Left Behind was very much bipartisan. And, and No Child Left Behind put into federal law a notion of accountability that still remains and states um, pretty much endorse. Mm -hmm. All right, I'm going to go to another question. Um, and this may get an interesting answer. There seems to be a divide uh, among people who I think are in many ways suspicious of what the Department of Education does, but they tend to agree, or many tend to agree that the federal government does have a legitimate role in collecting education data, publishing mm -hmm. education data. This is something it does with the National Center for Education Statistics. You could argue that the National Assessment of Educational Progress is, is part of that uh, overall effort. Um, uh, do you think that there is a federal role in data collection and dissemination about education? And is that something best done through a Department of Education or maybe someone else? Uh, Cindy, we'll have you go first. Yeah, yeah, no, that's a really important question. The data collection responsibilities of the Department of Education are very important and have had a big effect because they... Uh, particularly, you know, I work a lot on discrimination issues and you can just the racial differences um, in, in education outcomes are very disturbing. And, and, there's, um, and there's been a lot of good research done based on the data collected by the federal government. Some of the most important is stuff that was put into the most recent version of the elementary and secondary school aid uh, education act, wait, ESSA. And that has to do with collecting money about expenditures for education. And you can do a lot of um, analyses by race and poverty of students using that data. I think there have been some problems with its quality, but we're going to get a lot more information about the quality of education and education outcomes in this country. And it's really because of data collected by the federal government and authorized by Congress. Great. Vicki? Well, as I was listening to the question, all I could think of are the debates going, you know, starting in the, the mid 1800s. We're just gonna collect a little data, they said. It'll be fine, they said. We just need about four clerks and a head. It won't be any big deal. Um, listen, I'm a researcher. Uh, I love data. And I will say that having a National Center for Education Statistics through the US Department of Education makes my life infinitely easier. But do I think that somehow data on education statistics would just stop if we didn't have the U.S. Department of Education? Absolutely not. Um, I guess we could move 
NCES into census, there might be the Census Bureau, but I really don't think we have to have a department, much less a bureaucracy to do this. Because if you look at the data too, a lot of basic data aren't there. It's still very hard to get. And let's face it, when we do have data, what happens when a state or a school or you know some entity doesn't fill in a form right, or we do get data that shows, gosh, the school's doing really bad, or this district's doing really bad. Eh, where's the enforcement? So we all like data. I think most of us are data people. I don't think we need a bureaucracy to get it. And there are no consequences if the data are bad or missing or the results are bad. So as much as I've had positive experiences with NCES, I would, I'd say no privatize it. Yeah, uh, my own thoughts are I certainly like to use the data. We've talked about NAEP enough here that we've been using the data. Uh, a lot of the data is about federal spending, so I think that's perfectly fine. Um, but I always worry about not the data itself, but the misuse of data. I've seen a lot of that, I think, in particular in higher education policy. Um, uh, certainly the for-profit sector has lots of problems. But I often see data taken out of context to say how terrible the for-profit sector is because they have bad loan default rates and things like that, without also including the data that shows that sector works with uh, students who face the biggest obstacle, uh, obstacles of any other sector of higher education. So, you know, it's certainly not something I'd say that's the first thing we should get rid of, but I do worry about the misuse of data. And data tends to give a veneer of omniscience that you often have to dig into it to realize we're not even sure that this data is telling us what we think it's telling us. Um, but certainly that is something I think people will continue to debate because there are a lot of people I think who are suspicious of the Department of Education who do think there is legitimate data collection role. Um, I'm gonna move on to another question. Uh, this comes from someone uh, who's going by DRock. Uh, and has an interesting question that is sort of about the Department of Education, but more about a federal role. They say they heard that the Christian church um, uh, was involved in the development of Western education. And I think there's certainly a lot of truth to that. Uh, they say, what can the church do to possibly impact education in America? Now, that's not totally directly related to the Department of Education itself, but it is something to, that I don't think a lot of people understand. Does some of the money that the Department of Education uh, distributes, does it reach religious schools? Because a lot of people do think religion is important in education. We talk a lot about school choice. Um, and I think people might need to know whether some of this money is coming from the Department of Education actually makes it to religious institutions. Uh, and I guess we'll let Vicki go first. Well, that's a great question. And, and again, it's it's hard to know how exactly all of this works. Uh, certainly when uh, Congress was debating the Elementary and Secondary Education Act, you know, leading up to 1965, we call it the Every Student Succeeds Act or ESSA today. There was a lot of debate over the role of faith-based schools and the contributions they make to uh, American education. So that's always been a very contentious issue. Under law, uh, private school students, private schools are eligible for certain federal funds uh, for disadvantaged children, for disabled children, and so forth. However, many private schools, particularly faith-based schools, are concerned that if they accept federal money, that they are going to be regulated, uh, not just regulated, but they are going to be, they're going to lose their autonomy and they're going to have to change their curriculum such that it, it violates uh, their beliefs and, and their values. So uh, faith-based schools in particular are really between a rock and a hard place because that there is quite a bit of money, federal funds available to them, but you're really taking your chances if you accept it because you don't know what kind of regulations you are also inviting in. But just to note, and you might have said this, um, but because I'm also reading questions, 
Um, but just to note, there was the sort of the idea of money following the child actually when the department was created. So there is federal money that can make it to a uh, private, including a private religious school. Um, but it is more through a school district providing services in that private school. Cindy, do you want to talk more about that? If not, that's totally fine. Um, yeah, no, you're absolutely right about that. But um, I'll just say if they accept money, they're going to civil rights laws will apply to schools that accept uh, federal funds. That is definitely a danger. Um, well, so now let me go on to one uh, question that comes, I think, from Twitter. Unfortunately, we don't have a name associated with it. Um, but these are important. This is an important question because I think that this was kind of the original goal of federal education policy, which the department is supposed to uh, execute. Um, they ask, what do you think about federal programs that specifically target low income students, such as Head Start, rural and low income school grant programs, the TEACH grant, et cetera? And I would note just to set it up that Head Start is actually in uh, health and Human Services. It's not actually in the Department of Education. Uh, some of these are in the department. Um, Cindy, uh, maybe you can speak especially about the goal of these kinds of programs and how you think they've worked. Well, their goal is to help uh, various categories of disadvantaged students. And they've had varying results. Those that focused on the youngest students, I think, have probably stronger results. Head Start, um, and Title I of the Elementary and Secondary Education, the, the, the elementary school results are probably better, although you, you all st st cited statistics at the beginning of this um, effort here today, and, uh, you know, the results aren't what we would like. But Head Start results are pretty good um, relative to not having it, for sure. And that's true of a lot of the other programs for disadvantaged kids. They haven't accomplished what everybody wanted, but things would probably be a lot worse if we didn't have them. Vicki? Well, I actually take a different view than, than Cindy on, on her last statement. Uh, the results, actually official government evaluations of Head Start uh, show that it is not done well. It's extremely expensive. And I think we would have been far better off to give family, I would call, you know, pre-K education savings accounts or pre-K ESAs uh, for families who couldn't afford uh, high quality uh, preschool and, and child care. Um, because I think that parents really do need different options, a whole host of different options when it comes to their their young children. And one of the, I think, most striking failures is that particularly with low income children, these preschool programs like Head Start will show that they do better initially, but within starting as soon as first grade, certainly by third grade, something called fade out happens where all the gains they've made simply dissipate. So we spent a whole lot of money that once children get into a, a regular school setting, fade out. Um, I think one of, one of the things we should be able to do with programs for low income, disadvantaged children and so forth is we should allow experimentation. I think one of the greatest dangers of sort of federal policy is that it's one size fits all policy. As we know, one size doesn't tend to fit anybody terribly well or only a few people well. We should be allowed to experiment. And I think that's one of the biggest problems with federal or national education policy. It really limits the room and opportunities we have to experiment. I mean, if it were left up to the federal government, we wouldn't have public charter schools. We wouldn't have state level parental choice programs. We certainly wouldn't have education savings accounts um, like a growing number of states have. So I would say, the more we can, and this is where I absolutely agree with Cindy, the more we can fund low, low and middle income families who genuinely need the financial help, the better. Keep the money out of the bureaucracies. 
to stop this kind of homogenization. homogenization. Cindy, uh, since Vicky disagreed with you, do you want to have a quick rebuttal? Yeah, so, yes, thank you. Um, well, I think the notion that Head Start uh, could be a one-shot thing for kids is just wrong. You have to continue to work with low-income kids. They, they don't change their family income just because of, of Head Start. They need help, you know, in kindergarten and first grade and third, you know, all the way through extra help. So I don't buy, I've never been very interested in this, these fade out issues because if you fade out because you don't get more support, that's the reason. Hmm. Well, I wish we could keep uh, having a debate about that. We actually did have a debate at Cato on pre-K, uh, I don't know, a couple of years ago. You can search for that. Uh, but I want to get to a couple more questions before we run out of time. Uh, this one goes back to data, and probably I will have to eat a little crow because I'm suspicious of federal data collection. But David asks, what is a good source of information about Department of Education spending that's available to the public? Um, and so I don't have to eat crow right away. I'll ask Cindy first. A source of information about federal spending? Yep. Um, well, Department of Education Department in particular. Department of Education website. Maybe, uh, maybe Vicki has a better answer. Vicky? Well, Cindy's absolutely right. You can basically you can look at the, uh, you know, the budget of the United States. And the budget's all, and you look at the uh, congressional justifications, I find that very helpful. And every agency will have um, historical spending. And if you go to the, um, is it the Congressional Budget Office, you go to the, you go through the White House, you go to actually go through the White, White House and just, or just do an internet search of budget of the United States of America. I'm not saying that, you know, once, once you get there, it's going to be easy to slog through all of it, but it is uh, publicly, it is publicly available, including current year as well as uh, historical spending. So that is available. Yeah, I would agree that the Department of Education website is a good place to go, although it's harder to find that budget button than it used to be. Um, uh, CBO. And then, uh, again, I have problems with the National Center for Education Statistics, but a convenient place to pretty easily find a whole lot of data uh, is the Digest of Education Statistics, which is online. One of its problems is it does take a long time for them to process data. So, like, I think the current most recent federal spend or uh, sorry, K through 12 spending data is from 2016 to 2017. So it's a little slow to get to the most up-to-date data, but it is a good place for one-stop shopping for data. So, and that is put out by the National Center for Education Statistics. So that's, you know, something that's useful. Um, here's a question uh, because of, I think, the Common Core, though it doesn't mention Common Core specifically, but it does sort of implicate uh, some sort of centralized control of education. Rosemary asks, what do you suggest for making sure that an A in California is the same level as an A in New Mexico, especially for college, college entrance consideration? Uh, Vicki, I think you're next to go first. Well, I don't think you're gonna like the answer because you would basically have to hand over your children to you know, the schooling factory where everything was the same, all children learned the same subject at the same time in the same way. You're going to have, you're going to have variances rather than rely on, you know, an A in Arizona being the same as an A in, in DC or other states. I would say, make sure that parents have every education option on the table available to them because parents don't have to wait around for quarterly grades or term grades or some state tests that they get, you know, a few hot minutes before the next school year starts. Parents can tell if their children are being held back in one subject or struggling in another. And I think the most important thing you can do is make sure that your child is, is progressing. And there are, all, there are various types of tests. Uh, grades can be very subjective. What matters most is that you see your child learning 
not being freaked out by all these tests that are happening and progressing and progressing well. There, there's no shortage of you know, private entities uh, around subjects that you can go to and see, you know, where should children generally be? And we have to be careful that, oh, my child is either ahead or behind of my neighbor's child. Because one of the dirty little secrets about, you know, being learning at grade level is that we think of distribution of children's achievement as this, uh, as these nice, neat, tidy little bells that work really, really well. The five-year-old should know this in this grade. The six-year-old should know this in this grade. Actually, children's brain development and such is more like a very uh, gentle speed bump in the road. So there's a huge distribution. So I think the most important thing is if your child seems like he or she is struggling, you should have every option to get the help they need to do better. Great, Cindy, final words? Well, that's this is one of the most tragic situations we have in this country. Um, you know, it's all well and good to say that parents should be able to get help with their kids, but in a lot of places they can't get any help. And parents, especially if they have limited education themselves, they're not always aware that their kids aren't learning what they should be. So, you know, we've done a very bad job in this country of dealing with these kinds of differences. And uh, I don't see much promise in the near future. Okay, well, unfortunately, we are out of time, but I want to thank everybody who's been with us, and, and I hope you've enjoyed and learned something from today's session. I especially want to thank uh, Cindy and Vicki for their uh, wonderful contributions for the discussion today. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm sure there, well, uh, there are definitely questions that I missed and comments that I missed. Uh, we will carry some of those over till tomorrow. Uh, I hope you'll join us tomorrow again from one o'clock to two o'clock Eastern time. Tomorrow we'll be discussing what should be done with the Department of Education, how it should or should not be changed. That'll give us a chance to talk about a lot of things that people have asked about, about how things should work. Um, and so don't give up. If we didn't get to your question, we may get to it tomorrow. Also, in anticipation of tomorrow's event, uh, there is a uh, paper that I've already mentioned once or twice. It's still a draft, but pretty close to completion. It's down at the bottom of the event page on Cato's website for this. It's called Right Sizing Fed Ed, Principles for Reform and Practical Steps to Move in the Right Direction. You may want to look at that before tomorrow and see what kind of things uh, may come up. Uh, one of the co-authors is me, but uh, one of the others is Jonathan Butcher from the Heritage Foundation, and he will join us tomorrow. And with that, I will bid you adieu until Friday. <laughs>